Good evening. It's again a precious privilege to greet you in the precious name of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And as always, it is looking to him. It is looking to our God in the trinity of his persons, seeking to bring honor and glory unto him in every way. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that with the aim that we be used to his glory and that you might be built up, as it were, in the most holy faith. We have no illusions as to ourself, to ability, to anything else that might make a contribution thereto. It is only by his grace, by his mercy, through the power of his spirit, that anything will be accomplished that would be acceptable in his sight and would be beneficial unto you. So even as I come to you just now, I do so praying fervently that he, the Holy Spirit, would empower, would enable all that we say and all to which we refer, and that in this assemblage of thoughts that we might bring to you this evening, that it would be in evidence that it is through his power and through none of my own, and that thus it might prove a blessing to us all as we would look to him. I urge you that you be much in prayer for each other, and in particular to pray that we might be, as the scripture describes, what the aim of Christ was in Galatians chapter 1, that we might truly be delivered from this present evil world. And I really believe that what the Apostle Paul was making reference to was not merely salvation. And when I say merely, that is salvation just by itself, not trying to belittle the thought, but not just salvation, but every manifestation of salvation, every characterization of salvation, everything about us that testifies of being the child of God might escape the influence of this present world, to be delivered from its characterizations, from its power, from its trials, from all of these things, that we might rather find ourselves in that way of trusting fully in the one who has redeemed us with his own blood, and with him who has brought to pass all things in such a fashion as to assure us that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none of the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that thought of salvation, I would remind you that our salvation is in three tenses. We're delivered from our past, that is, the past guilt and the penalty of sin, and that has been settled, been accomplished through his substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection on Calvary's cross, that we're being saved in the present tense, that we are being continually delivered up unto him, being continually directed through the operations of either spirit within us, the indwelling of the Father and the Son within us as he promised that we might indeed live our lives unto him in this present world and thus we live in the hope that we shall one day be delivered from the very influence or the very presence of sin in every way so we're delivered from sin's penalty we're delivered from sin's power and we shall be delivered from sin's presence what a delightful prospect we have I urge you, pray for each other then in that line. Think in terms of the things that afflict, the things, and that includes physical or whatever it might be, that would tend to distract our attention away from the grace of God as it is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's look to him just now. Father, I thank you, I praise you for marvelous grace, for grace that is greater than our sin, for grace that enables us to look to Thee and to know forgiveness, to be able to delight in Thee in every way. I pray, O Lord, that You would bless those to whom I speak, and I think in terms of my churches, 
that, Lord, you would manifest your mercy in all, that we might indeed know that familial relationship and the expression of love one toward another and thus manifest the love of God in us. Guide us just now as we would look into your word, and I ask this through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. I want to take you to some thoughts that will lead us to several passages of Scripture. And I'll begin looking in Romans chapter 14. And I want to talk about the sources of kingdom joy. And we, we know about joy. We know what it is. And, and to many, the idea of joy is just feel good, happy. And I'm, I'm, uh, you know, just, I'm, I'm, I'm in a good mood. Um, something has entertained me. And there's all sorts of things. Spiritual joy reaches far deeper, addresses a wider spread of considerations, and is especially anchored in our knowledge of God, knowing God, and knowing of His person, knowing of His mercy and grace, and this of knowing Him, and of knowing that we are indeed His dear children. And so... When I think of that joy and I think of kingdom joy, I am reminded of the fact that this is fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is, and we've come across this often in this most recent series of studies, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And we're going to address those three things uh, in the initial thoughts that we will have here just now. And so I look in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17 specifically. Uh, and let me just go ahead and read the verse before that. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. And so there is a thought with regards to protecting our reputation as being who we are. And then Paul continues, for because the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For in that these things serveth Christ, for he that in these things, those thoughts, serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. So Paul is addressing two issues here. One is how do we come across to others? And then more especially, how do we find ourselves in the way of acceptance with God and the confidence of our acceptance with God? And so he characterizes it in this way. But I love the thought, and I am often drawn to reflection upon the kingdom of God. Now I realize when... Most people think in terms of a kingdom. Sometimes they're drawn back into a, a world in the past where there were kingdoms manifested all over the place with literal kingdoms serving in lush palaces and or manifesting their power over others. And some were characterized as good kings and some were not so good. And even in the biblical record in the Old Testament, we find not only that was there a king given, but it, as being man's choice in Saul, and that didn't work out so well. But then David was God's choice, and many things then come to be manifested to us about what constitutes a good kingdom and what is a proper kingdom, and thus it is pointing us ultimately to the kingdom of God, which is under the rule and reign of King Jesus. And so thus we then are given to trace lines of kingdoms down through the Old Testament, and we realize that they were on both uh, divided, the kingdom got divided after Solomon, and that there were good and bad kings on both sides of the division. But more often than not, idolatry was in the midst, self-seeking characterized the way of kings, 
and the subjects of those kingdoms were not always happy people, nor did they know joy because they were led or they were given over to idolatry and toward an attachment to the things of this present world. And so when I read now of the kingdom, and I am often drawn to uh, the reference of our Lord himself in early on in his ministry when he declared, repent ye and believe the gospel, and then added that the kingdom of of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. And with him making that statement, I think it was not just that it's about to happen, although it did come to be manifested, and but rather that it was there. It was he was the king, and that which he was assembling in the way of people were subjects and the characterization of this under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of our Lord and their identity together with him would constitute truly his kingdom. Now, if he is king, unto you this day is born a king. And that thought that he was a king from his birth wasn't looking in prospect. It was looking in present and therefore Jesus was king from the beginning. He was declared to be so. Now, it waited for the manifestation, and we're still waiting to see the full revelation of the kingdom of God. Now, what happens with man? They begin to liken the kingdom of heaven as being some future thing only, and it is future. There's no question that the full revelation of it is yet to come, and the material aspects of it are yet to the full revelation and material um, manifestation is yet to be fully revealed. But what we do have is, and I'll, I'll cite a few instances. Number one, Jesus making the statement to the Pharisees that the kingdom is within you. Another word there perhaps is better rendered among you. But the idea of within was the people, you're rubbing shoulders with subjects of the kingdom. It wasn't that it was indwelling them, but it was in their midst. It was there and would be manifested by the devotion of his disciples. And so that was still in the way of being perfected, and that's another message for another time. But a second thing that I would call your attention to with regard to the spirituality of the kingdom is that when Pilate was examining Jesus and he makes the statement, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And that, you say, okay, what's the big deal about that? We, he could still be talking about a future kingdom, but he didn't talk about it in, in, in the future. He talked about it as a present reality. And this I firmly believe, that inasmuch as Jesus is declared to be king, we are his subjects. And I do believe what, that there is to be understood the present reality of the kingdom of God. And so here in Romans chapter 17, or Romans chapter 14, verse 17, he didn't say the kingdom of God will be, will not be meat and drink, but it will be righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It, that's what it is now. And this we must realize that the characteristics of the subjects of the kingdom of God are the manifestation of these things. So it's interesting that when Paul was writing of the fruit of the Spirit in the, in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, that the first three things that he mentions are the same things that are set forth here. And although he, he doesn't mention love here, but he does, it, it comes to be understood because for and he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and proved of men. And so we, even if you want to argue the point that he doesn't say love here, he does mention peace and joy, which were characteristics of those things. 
And so what do we mean then? Righteousness. And again, I want you to bear in mind as we go along what the thoughts are here. Kingdom joy. And we'll see that in some different ways, but primarily what I want you to understand is that where there is the manifestation of the kingdom, there's cause for us to rejoice. And so where the things of Christ are made manifest. Now, inasmuch as he says righteousness, and of course, he speaks first and foremost of that of the righteousness of Christ. Because when we think in terms of the righteousness of Christ, we think of it in two ways. Number one is that it was manifested in him and that it is that is who he is. He is the righteousness of God. He is the manifestation of the righteousness of God. But then, as we would even understand those things, we would realize that what righteousness is, that the righteousness that makes us accepted in the beloved is the righteousness of Christ in us. And that righteousness, we understand it as being imputed, as being imparted, and as being appropriated. We say, okay, what's that mean? Well, it means that, first of all, we are given credit with it's on the record that he has given us, he has imputed, put our righteousness, put credit for what he has done on our account. And so that's the first part of it. And we're passive in that. He, that's grace. He just does that. It's not because of anything that he finds in us, but it's imparted to us in the way of character. And thus we're made to understand that we are partakers of of the divine nature, born again of the Spirit of God, and that part of that characteristic, he's written his laws in our hearts and in our minds, that they are part and parcel with us. And so here we are, again, being having it characterized and realizing that there is a desire, and if there's not a desire for holiness in you, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. That's a very strong warning. Read uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and test yourself. Find out what are your likes? What is your relationship to the kingdom of God? What are your desires? What are your aspirations? And if it's not holiness, then there's a problem. But that's the nature that is in us that we are to be pursuing and that we do pursue and desire that that holiness be fully manifested and that is appropriated. It's believed. It is trusted. That is, it is claimed unto ourself. It is taken unto ourself by that thing we call faith. This is not just a blind situation. Faith looks very clearly upon the faith, face of the Lord Jesus Christ, sees the promises of God made to be yea and amen in him, fully done, fully taken place, and therefore we are made to be then at peace. And so it is righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. And so when we come to that place that is joy in Christ, by the operations of the Holy Spirit within us, because there is nothing in this. There are some things that get characterized as painful, and I think specifically in terms of repentance. And sometimes we deal with the painful reality that we're born in sin and, and that we are given over unto unrighteousness right from the very beginning and thus being brought to the place of repentance over sin, that is painful. But at the, at the same time, to come to the realization that there is forgiveness with thee, as the psalmist often said, there is forgiveness with him. His mercy endures forever. Mercy, there is plenteous mercy with him. And those are the causes of joy. Those are the causes of rejoicing. There we're able to approach unto God as one delights in coming into the presence. I used to, as the, the both of us aged and went along, I lost my father at an early age. My mother lived a long time. 
but oft times I had the occasion, usually every couple of weeks at least, I was able to go and visit with her. And I know every time when I would come into the room, it was evident, two things that were evident. Number one, I loved to see my mother. Number two, she made very clear that she was happy to see me. And so when you say, okay, what's that have to do with this? I love to come into the place of my heavenly Father. I love to come into the place of my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. I love the operations of the Holy Spirit within me that brings these things to life and to reality and to light life and immortality through the gospel of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the characteristic of the kingdom. That's the nature of the kingdom to us. That's the way we experience it. That's what we enjoy. And so it, it comes about. But also it entails and includes the uh, administration, if you will, of power. Uh, we, we think, for example, of grace. And we, some people might still be contesting the idea of a kingdom right now. But that kingdom is right now. And note, for example, in Romans chapter 5, 21, that as sin hath reigned uh, uh, unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. If that's not a reign, I don't know what it is. And if, if someone is reigning, it must be the king. And if it's reigning over us, then that must be just a wonderful uh, order of operations, a wonderful rule of life, a wonderful experience to know that our loving Lord, our caring God, our suffering substitute, the one who has accomplished our salvation is ruling and reigning in all things. And so I love the thought from the Old Testament. How do these things, well, how do we view things? How do we look upon things relative here to this joy in the Holy Spirit? And there are some things that speak to us of the power of God. In the Old Testament scripture, when the kingdom was being restored, and we read this from Zechariah chapter 4, and the um, declaration, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, who was the governor uh, over the, the, the Israelites at that point in time, that it, it is, he said this, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. That's Christ. It is by his spirit that rule and reign and that accomplishments are being made, that the kingdom is being uh, substantiated, that the kingdom is being experienced, that it is being continued, that it is not subject to the powers of this world. But with Christ saying to Pilate, it's not, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, we could overcome. We would take up arms. We would do all of this. But the fact is that Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, in the midst of some of their squabble, he advised them and let them know, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And that power, obviously, is that of the Holy Spirit. And that power, realized, points us and leads us and encourages us to be joyful and expectant as far as the things of the Lord are concerned. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love. See the connection here. It comes back into play. And of a sound mind. And so note the characteristics there of the spirit. Uh, three things that we would understand. He's given us the spirit of uh, not of fear, not, nothing to be afraid of. I refuse to bow to all the fear-mongering that's going on in the world today. 
And believe me, the world, the, the government is trying its best to scare us. This one's going to kill you. This the disease is going to take you out. This is going to do this. And this is going to do that. Nobody is saying, where is God, my maker, that giveth us songs in the night? Songs bespeak of rejoicing, of celebration, and of all of this. But he's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. We're the conquerors. Yea, more than conquerors through him that loved us. And thus, to be able to understand that and to experience that of love, love to God, the love of God, the experience that we are loved of God, and that we are able to manifest that love with each other. And then of a sound mind. Remember the first time I read that, I thought, oh, is he excluding people who are mentally disturbed? No. He's not even talking about that. He's talking about the ability to reason on a scriptural level. Now, many say, well, no, this is not logical. Use scriptural logic. And it begins, begins with this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I deduce everything else in the word of God from that essential truth. It is he that has created, it is he that has established, it's he that has brought it all about. So we can rejoice in many things. Peter writes this in addressing the strangers, the elect strangers as he calls them. And it's written in different translations, have a little different version of it, but it all comes back to the same thing, that they were elect according to the foreknowledge of God, and listen to this, through sanctification of the Spirit. Many people, if you mention the choice of God, oh, God just indiscriminately chose or God just arbitrarily chose and it doesn't make any difference about what the person was like. No, no. All of that is taken care of together. Do you understand that? It is God exercising this, God the Holy Spirit bringing about because it is through the sanctification, the setting apart, the qualifying, the enabling, the empowering of the Holy Spirit that brings these things about. And the result is obedience, obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, what's that mean? Well, the sprinkling in the Old Testament, the blood was sprinkled upon the various elements that had to do with the ordinances, with the sacrifices. And the idea that we are under, we are sprinkled by the blood of Christ means that the declaration or the evidence of the operations of Christ, which were done on Calvary's cross, whereby he shed his own blood for our sins brought us then unto this way. And that is the qualifying factor that we are redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so we're given to understand the, the, uh, the, the elements, if you will, and the reality of the kingdom. The apostle wrote, and whoever the writer of Hebrews was, this, he says, and here's present reality once more. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Do we understand what he is saying there? We're, we're receiving, we're in that process of being ministered to in the context of a spiritual kingdom by a true king, the only king. He is Lord of Lords. He's King of Kings. He is all of those things. And we are made subject to him. We delight in him. We are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. It's undefeatable. It cannot be set aside. It is that force which all the rest of the world, all the opposition, will ultimately submit to, will bow to. And so let us have grace. Let these thoughts be in our hearts and in our minds. Let us be in that way of rejoicing. Let us know that joy in the Holy Spirit. After all, 
the very nature of the kingdom is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. May the Lord grant that blessedness to you just now.